All right, welcome everyone to another Rocket Dollar webinar. Uh, I have Nathan here today. Uh, Nick, can you just drop a slide so we can see Nathan's face nice and big for a second? Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, thanks, Nick. Uh, so we have Nathan here of Mid Atlantic. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, secured notes and, and notes today, and um, you know Nathan's experience in that space. Um, why do we do these Rocket Dollar webinars? If you've been here plenty of times, you already know this. Sorry to repeat this, but these are to do education in the alternative space. We have some people that come to us from private equity, crypto, real estate. You know, they might be an expert in their own field, but it might be very narrow. They're very good at a very particular type of asset class. They're not really an expert in a wide breadth, uh, even in their own field, or maybe in different asset classes. So we do these educational webinars so that um, you know people in the retirement space, investing in alternative assets can be aware of more um, assets, more opportunities, and be better educated investors about you know not the alpha that there is to gain there, but also the risks associated with different spaces. Um, so really happy to have Nathan here today. Nathan, I'd love if you introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, Brennan. Um, my name is Nathan Larson. Um, I run and manage the Mid-Atlantic Secured Income Fund. And um, we've got some of my folks on, on the call with us today that will be available for questions. We've got Andrew, Michelle, and, and Josh Bennett with us. And um, we look forward to giving a lot of information to you, given, hopefully offering some strategies that could work in the retirement accounts with Rocket Dollar. and um, Happy to be here and happy to share okay. some knowledge. And Nathan, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? Like what industries have you worked in and maybe before Mid-Atlantic and like how long yeah. you've been at Mid-Atlantic? Yeah, so my background is in banking and running um, running debt portfolios for large banks. Um, most of my career was spent with Wells Fargo and um, ran up to over the course of a few years of up to $500 million dollar uh, debt portfolio um, in their consumer and financial management department. Okay. And where's Mid-Atlantic located? And in kind of your previous, you know, to add on to that with your previous experience at like Wells and the other banks, did you have maybe like regional areas you were focusing on or were the, the banks kind of sending you like countrywide? Uh... Right. So um, we're headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, and we do loans primarily in Georgia, but all over the Southeast. Um, my the last bank I worked for, I ran the Southeast Department um, for, the, for the United States, everything from Charleston, South Carolina, all the way over to Houston, Texas. So primarily in the South, a lot in the Northeast and Midwest with um, Wells Fargo as well. Great. And, and yeah, those are some of the areas we've seen some of the most investment activity, frankly, in the last uh, 15, 20 mm -hmm. years. Uh, so great to hear. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Nick, can you pull up Nathan's slides here? Um, and just so you know, to the audience, you probably might already know this, but the Q&A is active. I have some questions I'm going to stop and pause Nathan for. Please feel free to start peppering him with questions as we kind of get into the meat of this. Great. All right. So let's, um, we can go to the first slide. So just a few things that we want to cover today. Um, we've kind of got five different sections. I want to talk about a little bit about what the fund is and how it operates and, and how it's structured talk about what our actual business practices are. How do we make money? Um, what are the operations of the business look like? And how does that pertain to each of you as potential um, investors? Um, talk about a lot of the different ways that we are able to diversify and uh, be very careful with our investments. Uh, we call it safety in numbers. It's just our way of talking about diversification within our portfolio. Um, also, we're gonna touch on how we sort of remove the speculative return models and how we can help investors really drive and determine their own results within their portfolio. So we're going to talk about that and, um, you know, and why this might work in your portfolio. We'll talk about some of the, our past investors, current investors, the things that they find really great about what we do. So we'll hit on that as well. So a little about what we do, right? Very, very simply put, we are a connection point. <clears throat> we create relationships with 
real estate developers, home builders, renovators, um, property development investors. We connect those people that want to develop property and develop value in it with investors that are looking to get a return and a share of that profit. So we are really just simply put a connection point between those two entities. So we're a Reg D private placement debt fund. And what that means is that we issue debt as uh, an asset class uh, and we um, lend money on debt as well. So the investors that invest with us um, are securitized by the debt in the business. And all of our loans that we make are secured primarily by real estate. And those, those security, first person security assets that we have are how our investors are secured. Um, wanted to talk a little bit here about our sort of mission, our story, how this came about, um, because I think it's interesting to a lot of people. Um, all of us uh, in the business kind of went through the great recession in 2008 and 2009. And we learned a lot from that being in the banking world. We learned primarily about how not to do things and how, um, how it can break and how to prevent that from happening. So we took a year, almost two years, and designed a model of lending that's very different than what a lot of the large banks are doing. Um, and our real mission was to sort of democratize access to um, what typically only very large investors would have access to, which is a diversified and relatively stable real estate portfolio. For a lot of investors, and especially with IRA investors, either folks that are about to retire or maybe just recently retired, they have enough to invest in maybe one or maybe two properties. If you're going to invest in real estate and you're doing it through an IRA, you really can't have a, an easy way to have debt along with that investment. So the barriers to entry are buying a property or loaning on a property, both of which are typically going to be four or five, maybe even 600,000, depending on your market in terms of your entry point for investment. Yeah. And That's a lot to, of eggs in one basket for most people. To, to add on what you're saying there, Nathan, he, um, some of your investors might have heard of UBIT or UDFI. And long story short, it tends to be a pain in the butt for our IRA investors. Our solo 401k investors do have a somewhat easier time with that process because they have some more tax breaks in a solo 401k that can protect against that. However, that does not mean applying for the loan is a painless process. You still have to go to a specialized lender. Yes, Rocket Dollar can refer you to one, but there's very few in the country. Um, sometimes those rates are uh, higher than the average that you're getting out there for a consumer mortgage, which wasn't that big of a deal to our investors. Like two years ago, they're like, ah, okay. So instead of three, it's like four and a half to five. That's much, much different now with rates going much higher. So now to get a non-recourse loan and kind of buy one of these individual properties, you got to go to a, a couple banks in the country. You got to talk to them and make sure they know your property is not risky. Um, then you have to make sure you're not going to get hit by any UBIT tax risk. Um, then if that bank doesn't really give you great terms, uh, cause rates are going higher, you, you really don't have a ton of options. So, um, you know, that this is, um, you know, it's a common story, but what do our investors do? You're either a single property person or maybe that's too difficult for you. Um, these are some of those options that are uh, more passive, uh, for an investor. Yeah, no, great points. So thank you very much. And, and to, just to add to that. Um, most of the folks that have invested with us have some real estate experience, but they don't want a five or six hundred thousand dollars single property risk investment in their portfolio. And if you do it that way, you're you're you've got one property, one neighborhood, and one market that you're exposed to. You've got a large initial barrier to entry. You've got one borrower or one tenant that you're tied to. Um, and it, it can just be a big risk. It's too many eggs to put in one basket. You don't know the timing of it. It's hard to determine when you, what and how and when your exit point to that investment may occur. 
And it's somewhat speculative. You're then tied, and in, in even with a lot of other funds or real estate type investments, you're tied to the market, you're tied to the real estate prices. And our investment and our fund is not tied to real estate prices. If they go up a little bit, they go down a little bit. The returns in the portfolio are pretty well balanced, regardless of what real estate prices are doing. So our mission from the beginning was, how can we offer a product to the everyday investor where they can have an entry point as low as 50 or $100,000, but still have access to a diversified real estate portfolio. They don't have to deal with tenants and leases and fixing toilets. You don't have to worry about buying and selling and the transaction costs of real estate. Um, you can pick your term, you can pick your return, you can pick your distribution rate, and you know what the value of your investment is going in, and you know what it is at the end and you know what your returns will be along the way. And that's really what our mission was from the beginning was to create a very simple product for people to understand and put them in the driver's seat. Pick your term, pick your rate, pick your maturity, pick your amount. So that's really the basis of the company. I think go to the next slide. So just a few of us in the company, that I introduced earlier, they're on the call today and available for questions. Um, but all of us have a real estate background, um, real estate and finance primarily. So, um, and both Michelle and I have years and years of experience managing debt portfolios, um, acquiring them, managing them, securitizing them, and, and distributing them. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so, a little bit more about what we do. Um, all of the assets, our assets in the fund are receivables, right? We don't typically own properties ourselves. We are the bank, right? So we make loans um, for people that are improving properties and creating value in them. We typically do short-term, what's called a short-term balloon notes. So each of our notes uh, are for a design period of time with a very specific exit point. Um, there's four different types uh, of lending that you see here on the right. Um, these, are, these are the receivables or assets that are typically gonna be in the fund in addition to cash. Um, so we do new construction, we do uh, acquisition and development loans for, for neighborhoods. Um, we do short-term bridge loans and refinance loans. Um, Bridge loans would be like if, if one of our borrowers owns a property free and clear, wants to borrow money for something else, maybe it's to buy a third property or you know, put money back into his business or hire additional contractors, we can leverage uh, the own property they have in order to raise capital for his business. And a lot of times we can be secured very, very well. We may lend two or $300,000 against a five or $600,000 home. Uh, so those are very, very safe loans. And then we also provide, um, you know, capital, secured capital for businesses. And, you know, when you're, uh, Nick, you can go back to the these four types of loans. And when you're using the word secured, I think it really be really helpful for the investors to know, uh, you know, how are these loans secured? So it's it's often good to talk about an example, like, could you maybe talk about like a small disaster scenario that might happen in some of these options? And then how would Mid Atlantic or you know your your fund mechanism step in to make sure to protect assets? Right. So we think of it like we're the mortgage company for the our borrowers, right? We're going to have first lien position on the real estate that we're lending against. Um, so that's how we secure it. All of our transactions are closed with attorneys, and they're all recorded at the whatever county the property's in. So we have a, a stamped and recorded security interest in every property that we lend against. Great. And uh, out of the four here, is there a certain few that is you know, a much higher percentage or is it kind of 25%, 25% point? Yeah, so um, the current uh, structure is about 30% new construction, single family home new construction, um, about 30% renovation lending, right? You purchase a home that's run down, maybe it's a historical property in a nice part of town, put a few hundred thousand dollars in it, 
and put it back on the market. That's about a third of the portfolio as well. Uh, the short-term bridge loans, that's probably about 15% of the portfolio. And the rest in terms of land acquisition, land development, lot loans that are uh, pending permitting um, and business capital loans, that's the remaining 10% or so with usually a 5 or 7% cash position. So okay. that's the current breakdown. And, um, you know, as investors join, you know, you're an accredited only opportunity, correct? So we have um, options for accredited and non-accredited investors. Great. So mo most of our current investors are accredited investors, um, sort of by default because um, the people that have invested in real estate in the past and have interest in it and knowledge about it tend to gravitate to our program. Um, mm -hmm. But we have we have some options for pretty much everybody. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, you know, if you're non-accredited, I know that's a very common FAQ. We yeah. often have non-accredited investors that have decent assets. They are tuning into these webinars because they want to look at opportunities, but they sometimes struggle. If we do a bunch of webinars, naturally the alternative space has tons of accredited only opportunities just because there's really strict regulations whenever you expand right. that. Um, so, so probably a good question to, to, to talk to people about one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can follow up with uh, Nathan's team after that one on one. But um, so, Nathan, you know, you kind of talked about there's a little bit of distribution of the fund. Is this like a continuous rolling fund, meaning that, you know, when investor number 35 joins, is their allocation exactly the same as the other investors that have been in the fund a long time as it updates? Or do they kind of join time stamped at a different point when their cash gets deployed? Right. So, um... Great question. So every investor is treated equally in terms of their security within the fund and new investors do not um, produce dilution in the fund for the existing investors. In other words, okay. it's an asset for asset add. Um, we balance our invest investments from our investors, which are, becomes our debt as a company. And when we acquire that debt on our balance sheet, we always have a one-for-one -one asset to back that up. And that asset's either going to be cash or receivable. So if someone invests $200,000 with us, we would take that $200,000 just in a simple, very simple example and issue a $200,000 loan with it. Okay. Or maybe $180,000 loan with $20,000 in cash on the balance sheet. Okay. So investor one from last year who invested $400,000 and we have a loan of $400,000, um, when investor two comes in and invests $200,000, that individual will have another asset on the balance sheet. And they're not tied together, right? That total of $600,000 is gonna be spread across the entire portfolio. It's not tying an investment to a loan specifically. Okay. Does that make sense? So, yeah, we, so we maintain that one-to-one -one ratio so that there's, um, you know, there's no leverage in the business. Mm -hmm. And um, each investor, new investor, doesn't dilute a previous investor in any way. Got it. Um, so I'll, I'll ask to make sure I can clarify, because I think, you know, often the audience is trying to think through these th same things themselves. What yeah. I'm hearing is that, um, you know, as new investors come and join, you might invest in new opportunities, but the new investors are exposed to all, all options in the portfolio or just the new ones, the most recent ones. Right. So it's as a fund, it's going to be structured, whereas um, the best way to look at it would be, let's say, just very, very simply put, let's say we had a million dollars invested mm -hmm. and the the 10th investor came in and said, here's $100,000 and that made that got us to a million. Got it. Well, we may make 10 loans, right? And they may represent 10% uh, of the assets in the fund as as one of our investors they're not going to be tied to one property, one loan. They're going to have a 10% interest in the entirety of the portfolio. They have exposure to every single uh, receivable and kind of uh, asset right. that's in there. And the best way to think about that is that we do it that way so that if we have one bad investment, it can't, mm -hmm. it, it can't hurt the whole fund. Yeah. Right. It's, it's um, diversified over many, many different uh, receivables. Yeah. So let's say like investment six went bad and then, you know, a bunch of investors had joined relatively around that time, uh, you know, th this makes sure that uh, the the herd is spread out equally and that protect that's protecting everyone's assets. 
so that a certain mm -hmm. class of investor is not getting an extra hit compared to others. Uh, exactly. And I think it. another really interesting and probably unique to this program is we create sort of a self-insurance mechanism built within the fund. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is every transaction that we close on for a property, we charge the borrower, the builder, um, a specific fee at closing. And we take that money and we contribute to a, a future loss provision fund, right? So every closing we have at no cost to our investor, we put money aside and put it into a rainy day fund that's separate from our cash balance sheet, that's separate from our investments. It's sitting there as, as money to ensure performance of the portfolio in case we did have a loss on a property. We took a 30 or $40,000 loss for whatever reason, mm -hmm. we would pull money from our loss provisions fund and keep all the investors whole. Got it. And one last question, I think we can get to the next slides. Uh, I kind of asked about your team's geographical experience and kind of, you know, your kind of historical experience mm -hmm. um, is, um, are these loans kind of spread out around the Southeast or just Georgia or kind of all, all, all over uh, the United yeah. States? So uh, historically we've made loans in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, about 90% of the portfolio is in Georgia. What's okay. great about Georgia and what's great about Atlanta is that it is such a large, thriving, growing market that you really have all the microcosms of many, many different markets. We've got North Georgia that's relatively rural, but growing and in the mountains. We've got coastal Georgia that's beach houses and developments. We've got a huge metropolitan area in Atlanta and many, many microcosms, even within the metro Atlanta area that are semi-suburban, suburban, in-town living, urban living. We've got all of it and we're able to diversify pretty, pretty well. And, and if you really are a student of knowing real estate, it's a very, very local business, right? The way that we are able to create security and stability within the fund is we know every neighborhood, we know every street, we know the builder that built the house across the street. We know what he paid for it. We know what he sold for it. And it creates this environment to where we're not going out and trying to look on Google, Google Maps and understand a market in New Jersey or Alaska mm -hmm. or Hawaii. These are properties that we can go and drive by. Got My it. partners and I go and walk every property with every borrower at the different stages of development. We go and walk the property. We take pictures of the property. We make we collect receipts for work done, and we always create an environment where we always have extra equity in it. By the borrower, we don't issue funds to get them to next stages. They get themselves to a stage on the property, and then we reimburse them. So it's 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 important also to consider that if for whatever reason we had a bar a borrower that couldn't complete a house. They pass away, they get deported, they leave the country, they get married and become an attorney. Whatever it is, we've always got money sitting in escrow to finish any of those projects because they don't get money from us until they've completed the stage and we reimburse them for work done. We don't issue funds and ask them to go use them wisely. It doesn't work that way. Got it. All right. Um, let's let's let you get to your next couple slides. Thank you, Nathan, sure. for going into mm -hmm. all that. I'll um I have I have one last question kind of as you before you intro the slide though, but wait, there's more. You said you talked about a lot about this rainy day fund. I think you kind of just answered that. Is that money invested in anything or like a low risk treasury or some cash equivalent or something like that? Yeah. So we've got the it is invested. It's um it's in a money market account earning about four percent. Okay. Yeah, you know, getting a percentage, but still in one of the most safest possible. Yeah, it's not dead money, accounts. but it needs to be immediately liquid. Yeah, your we, team needs that need potentially at any time um, as these projects come up or an unexpected something comes a little, maybe a few weeks yeah. early. Correct. Great question. All right. Um, we're here on the note lending basics here on the next slide. Yeah, so we just put this slide in. I've, uh, any of you know, Neil Ferguson, is, uh, I've read all of his books. He's a uh, economic and history professor at Harvard. Um, but 
um, he, he, you know, he wrote a book called The Ascent of Money, and he described lending as the process of transferring idle money into the hands of the industrious and exchanging a share of profit for that. And that's just at our core what we want to do. If we've got retired folks, they know the business, and they just want a passive income or what they want to know what the returns are going to be in their IRA and they want to know when they're going to be in there. This is a great way to share in the profit that's going on in the real estate market without having to deal with tenants, toilets, and closing attorneys. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. And I think some of our clients, um, they have a very real understanding of like, you know, the tenants and toilets part, but sometimes right. so since they're only going into one investment, they're not always, um, you know, they may have deployed capital, but they've only do, done it like once every four and a half, five years. So this right. is a much more, in this strategy, you know, Nathan's team is going out and doing this kind of process constantly. Okay, we can go to, the, I think the next one. Yeah, so this is, we, we built a slide to sort of demonstrate what we as an asset manager do on a day-to-day -day basis to sort of earn our keep and, and what are the day-to-day -day goings on of the business, right? So um, definitely don't know, need, need to go through all of these, but these are all the things that we would do on the investor's behalf, right? These are all the things we're doing behind the scenes to create the business model and to create revenue within the, within the portfolio. So we can probably go to the next one. So uh, Andrew and I created this, just an illustrative example here of kind of how the fund works for people that are new to the fund type of business. Um, really simply put, you've got multiple investors that put money into a pool. Um, and we as a fund and our asset manager then deploy that money out on to multiple borrows on multiple projects and multiple properties. So it's a way for a bunch of smaller uh, investment points to create a large scalable investment portfolio, but then is diversified across many different properties and projects. So we started lending money in 2010. Um, and there's so many presentations that I've seen that of folks that are doing transactions, whether it be developing or improving uh, multifamily apartment communities where they've got had one, two, maybe three full, full cycle transactions under their belt. Well, we've have hundreds. We have a very simple model and we repeat it over and over and over again. And I think it's now exceeded 500 full cycle debt transactions. Um, and none of those transactions to date have uh, resulted in a loss. Um, we know that that track record will not have last forever as we scale. And that's what our rainy day fund is for. But uh, so far, so good. And um, we invest very, very conservatively. A good example would be um, if we were going to do, uh, our average note is about $300,000. And that's going to have, that's going to carry a collateral value of five hundred to $600,000 typically. Our average current loan to value is about 68, 69%. So what that means is that on a million dollar home, a, a, a property worth a million dollars, we're typically going to lend 680 to $690,000. Um, and then we diversify that over a whole pool. So if we have $10 million out in receivables, we may have 1.5, 1.6, 1.7 dollar, 1.7 million in collateral for every million that we've lent. So that's the way we're able to decouple our returns from real estate prices. They can go up and down. If we have a million dollars lent and the collateral is worth 1.5 or it's worth 1.7, we still are earning interest on a million dollars, regardless of how that shifts and moves over time. Yeah. And Nathan, you talked about like you've never taken a loss on any of these investments. Are there certain times where you've had to step in and uh, take a lean? Uh, you know, I don't know, frankly, all the correct term terminology, but step in mm -hmm. and um, close in that lane and basically repossess part of that lane. And then how, how is that? Yeah. How does that process Very look after you step in? 
Yeah, great. Very, very few is the is the answer. And I'll and I'll go through a few examples of what you're asking about. But the reason that they're so few and far between, put yourself in that position as an investor. If you had a house worth a million dollars and you owed me 680000 are you going to let me take possession of that collateral? I mean, I'm, I'm going to lose the property, so I'm going to move heaven right, and earth course to not. not do it. If, if you end up in a scenario where you don't have the means to pay, you just sell it and pay me off and mm -hmm. pocket three or $400,000, right? So there's no motive to stop paying us. Because there's no benefit. It's, it's, it would actually, the ones that we have had to, to do that on have been windfalls for us. Um, I'll give you an example of one that we did last year. We had, unfortunately, we had a, a really wonderful builder of ours pass away. Um, he was in his late 40s, but unfortunately, life happens and it was a bad day for him and his family. He owed us about $600,000. We took ended up taking possession of the home and selling it for $920,000. And we made so much money on that transaction, we actually did a special dividend for our investors. So there's scenarios like that where the worst case can actually be the best case. And it seems kind of funny to think about that, but if we're diligent about sticking with our very conservative investment strategy, then our worst case scenarios can be our best case scenarios. Yeah. So, you know, what I'm hearing is for some of the, you know, as far as the interest being aligned, when the lean and the pressure is coming up on some of these investors, it's really better for them to maybe try and uh, exit or, you know, exit that opportunity. And, you know, you have first lean, so they're going to have to pay you first <laughs> anyway, but that gets the heat off of them is frankly paying you first because um, you're not, you're not the second or third lean in these situations here. We're, we're almost universally the first and only lean. Okay. And what would be a situation where you would be the second? Just curious, since you're mostly almost always the first. Well, yeah, the situations where we have been a second lean position are typically when we are also in the first. Got position. It. So if, for example, either the fund or our asset manager, Credo Capital, who is our day-to-day -day operator, um, if one of those two entities had a first mortgage, maybe the other one would take a second. Or maybe we have one of our private investors that has a first and the fund would have a second. But in every scenario like that, we're going to be in the driver's seat, meaning that we're in control of both the first and the second lien if we did have a second lien. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, uh, Asha Shaher. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. You're always great at ask, uh, asking us questions. So we'll answer, uh, ask some of the first ones here to Nathan. Um, the, the depreciation is typically in the non-retirement sense. We're not afraid to take like non-retirement tax type questions here in a webinar, but is depreciation typically passed on to an investor? And if you're an investor, this is usually when you're thinking about your taxable accounts. Typically when you're in a retirement account, yeah. you cannot be writing off a, a depreciation. Correct is the answer. And even with uh, a lot of our money is outside a lot of our investors have invested with us outside of qualified accounts as well and we do not uh, pass depreciation on to our investors the reason why is because we're not the property owner the property owner is the one that gets to experience that that tax benefit and that depreciable asset but um and 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 it's important to note that although we have a long-term vision of real estate most of our loans are very short term typically 12 to 15 months in their entirety so there's really just, there's not a lot to depreciate and we're not the owner of the property anyway, mm -hmm. uh, un unless we were to be you know, granted the property for some reason, but we're the bank in the property and the bank's not gonna be able to depreciate that asset. Got it. Um, and what's the liquidity schedule look like for investors, both short-term and long-term? Yeah, so on the investor side, we're going to dig into that a lot in a future slide. But the, the question, the, the, the simple answer for now is that you can pick um, investment timelines that are between two and five years, um, mm -hmm. depending on the type of investment you have and the amount. Okay. Um, investors have liquidity options as early as 12 months. So in, in every term, there, there's going to be liquidity options after 12 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Mr. You yeah, Mr. I was Gupta. just going to say a lot of the funds that are doing this uh, are going to have like a five or a seven year lock where mm -hmm. 
they are going to take your money, invest, pull it, pull it, and maybe make investments in one or or two very large developments that are going to appreciate sort of probably but speculatively over time and hope for an end profit. Mm-hmm. Um, and they need your money. They're going to take it. They're going to use it to build the property and the sale date of that property maybe years out and they don't have liquidity options for you. What's unique about our portfolio is that we have dozens and dozens of loans in it and Mm -hmm. they are all maturing at different stages and different levels. So our fund has constant liquidity. We have multiple payoffs every month that create uh, cash on the balance sheet that we use to either liquidate uh, investors if they need to, or we deploy it right back into another investment. Got it. Yeah, and I think we we touched on that a lot earlier, but you know the mid Atlantic structure of like all of these rolling different opportunities that you're going through and the investors are participating in, versus like I tried to really clarify this. Some other funds could work, and again, investors on the call, if you are looking at opportunities, be very aware there could be like a fund oper- fund like or some type of opportunity, but you might be going into just a few properties, but not um, many, many different properties and loans at the same time. So always be aware of what the structure is. And that does change liquidity pretty drastically because if it constricts the managers, right. they naturally usually pass the liquidity strengths onto you. Um, so I think we answered this already, but is the fund evergreen? That's like a common term to describe like more of a rolling fund. It's an evergreen than- fund, correct. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, we got a returns question. Um, typically I defer to the, um, to the manager here, if they're comfortable talking about returns of the fund on the call, uh, or just some generalities, uh, Nathan, I'll give it to you if you want to answer that or not, or we can move yeah, on. Yeah, we actually, in a couple of slides, we have a, a, a really nice slide that talks about returns. So it, okay. as a visual aid that l- let me answer that question when we have that slide in front of us, because I think it would be a more it. helpful. All right, let's keep moving. We'll yeah. we'll answer the next question from Mr. Gupta as uh, we continue on. Yeah. So one of the questions we have is, uh, is hey, well, if if the loans that we're making are relatively safe, why are and these are really good qualified borrowers? Why aren't they just going to the bank? Right. Well, we are a bank, and we're a competitor to a bank. That's that's the model that we have. But the difference is, instead of us lending out um, our depository money, we're raising capital and issuing debt and paying interest on that debt, just like your bank would pay to you in a money market account or a savings account. And so it's, it's a very similar model, just a little bit different way of going about it that creates much, much more business efficiency. Uh, we can pay more money out because we don't have hundreds of thousands of people that have 10 or $20 in a checking account and banks and brick and mortar uh, offices and tellers we don't have any of these massive overheads uh, that in the traditional banking world exist. So we can pay a lot more interest out uh, to our borrowers. Um, and we're more of a first class ticket for, for, for the people that uh, borrow money from us and the project developers. We, we describe our product very much like that, right? We can, you're gonna fly to the same city, you're just gonna have a lot easier, more comfortable time getting there. And as we uh, build relationships with the folks that we lend to, they come to value that first class seat. We can wrap up a loan process in as little as a week or two. And many banks right now, um, you know, especially on a commercial loan, could be four, five, six months in process mm-hmm. time. And even a yeah. simple residential loan could be three or four months. Yeah. Um, whereas they can come to me, I can look at the property in a day or two or have our portfolio manager, Mark, go and walk the property and meet with them. And we can give them a lending decision that same day. Great. And uh, so what I'm hearing, Nathan, is, you know, you're not a regulated bank, but to these business partners and builders, you are almost like a bank-like entity to them because they can come tap funds from you much right. on a much quicker time scale. Um, and, and a lot of them are very, very qualified. I don't want to give the impression that this is in any way subprime lending. These are very, very qualified buyers with excellent credit, people that have been building and developing property for decades. Most of the folks we've done business with, we've known for years and years, even back to when I was banking them at Wells Fargo or my partner Mark was banking them at SunTrust uh, 15, 20 years ago. 
Yeah. And so yeah. we know them all the way back from the banking days. And we are not a one size fits all solution to their, their business models. We are, we are one beautiful chord in that guitar and they can strum different chords when they choose to. And sometimes the bank has the best loan for them, for them on that project. And that timeline works. Sometimes they have to act fast. The biggest challenge in the property investment market right now is finding opportunities. So many great lots have been built on. So many homes have been renovated in the past 15 or 20 years that the toughest part about the business is not renovating a house, it's finding an opportunity. And when they find one, they need to be on the spot and they need to be essentially a, a cash buyer in order to get, get yeah. grab those opportunities. And when I can close on a house with them in a week or two, and it gets them an opportunity, but that they don't have an opportunity with, if they're going through traditional banking models, then they're willing to pay significantly more money to me mm -hmm. because we're creating an opportunity that does not otherwise exist without the product. Yeah. And from what I'm hearing, you know, this is just my relatively, I've done two like real estate investments, somewhat similar, not exactly like mid Atlantic, but for what I'm hearing, uh, at least from real estate right now, there might be a lot more sellers right now and a few less buyers, but competition over like prime A plus opportunities is still extremely competitive uh, across Look, many the, different asset classes. The, in, the inventory for, especially for distressed properties is extremely low in almost every market, especially in Atlanta. And if you look at the days on market in terms of what, how, how many days of inventory do we have listed at any given time? You, we have moved from a, a very manic real estate environment over the past two years or so to much more of a stabilized uh, real estate, you know, a supply and demand relationship. But if you go back to 2016 or 17, when we would look at it as a very healthy, balanced real estate market, mm -hmm. typically the day, the number of the amount of inventory that's on the market at a given time is about five to six months worth of inventory. A year, a year and a half ago, we were down in Atlanta to two or three weeks of inventory, right? Instead of mm -hmm. five or six months, at some points we were down to 20 or 21 days worth of inventory on the market. Right now we're sitting at 90 to 120 days. So even now, as we look at it, we're, we see on the news and we we look at changes like the slide you were showing me about Austin. If you look at it compared to a year or two ago, the inventories are up, right? If you look at it compared to what we would consider a healthy real estate market, maybe five or six years ago, we have still today almost half the inventory that we have in what we would all consider a typically stable and healthy real estate environment. Got it. So inventories, comparatively speaking, historically are still very low. Okay. Um, I think this is a great conversation. I'm going to try and help us naturally pick up the pace because we got some great. questions and now we got some more slides. So yep. Mr. Gupta, Mr. Gupta asked, you, you know, are rising rates um, affecting you right now? I think you kind of went through the change of inventory seems like one of the biggest changes you're going through right now. So rates um, in, in, for a lot of respects can help us because um, we have bank, raised our rates yeah. along with fine, right? So um, we've raised our rates in the past year about 200 or 250 basis points on what we are charging our borrowers. And we try to keep that as close to lockstep as we can with the rising costs of our receivables. So we have multiple individual investors and multiple institutional investors. And our institutional investors, typically our cost of funds with them is tied relatively close to prime. So as that cost of funds goes up and, and we just raised the returns we're paying to our individual investors in January, the highest they've ever been. That opportunity, uh, as we raise rates to our borrowers, is passed along to um, our, le our lenders and our investors. Great. Um, and Christy's question, she just asked, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to have her refer to the recording because we went through this really extensively, the makeup of your fund between residential yeah. to kind of raw land to short-term bridge shown store, even more business and builder, uh, you know, business capital receivables. So Christy, we'll send out the recording after this at around 20-ish minutes. We went over this like real intensely. 
um, uh, we'll send out that email later uh, today that you can look through and we'll put a little chapter on it so you can find that section. But uh, it's the method one, method two, method three, method four slide. All right. Um, so all right. This is a quick slide. I'll, I'll hit it very quick. It's, it's just another way that we create consistency in our returns and the way we create um, you know, low delinquency and, and, and very careful conservative lending habits. Uh, we call it the four C's of lending. So these, these are the things we really focus on when we make any lending decision. And so we could go into questions on any of it, but let's keep moving for now. So we talked about diversification and I think it's really important to just hit back on that for a minute um, because the real sweet spot of this investment is the ability to leverage diversification within one small investment or one large investment. But we have multiple borrowers. Um, we span different geographies. So we're not tied to one part of town or one neighborhood or one property. We have different property types different project types and different security types. So we have many, many ways of diversifying the portfolio so that we do not have very, very little um, returns are not leveraged to one specific thing or one specific part of town or, or the performance of one specific project. And that's, that's the case. Keep going. Yeah, so just, um, Wanted to touch just on sort of returns. It's just starting to get into the return part of the slides. So, um, you know, a lot of the folks that invest with us are at a point in life or use us for the allocation, sort of a fixed income allocation portion of their portfolio. So unlike even traditional fixed incomes where you would buy maybe treasury bonds, for example, or tradable um, REITs, where you have a relatively well-defined distribution schedule, they're still tradable. They still change in value. The prices of them can go up or down as the market changes. Um, and even when you're trading fixed incomes like bonds, as rates go up, the price will go down. As rates come down, the prices will come up. So you're not really locked in, even if your distribution might be fixed, your value is not fixed. Um, but what's unique about ours is if you invest $250,000, it stays worth $250,000 at the end of your two or three year note, still worth $250,000. You can pick your value, you can pick your return, you can pick your distribution and you can pick your maturity. So. That's what we talk about as defined returns. You're defining your return, when you get it, and, um, and how much you're getting back at the end. Go next slide. So this is our, this is our current rate sheet. So we talked, uh, I know there's probably a bunch of questions about the returns. What are they? How much do you get? When do you get it? So this is that, this is that information. So we compare um, different maturity terms with a rate, a corresponding rate, you can pick your distribution schedule, whether it's monthly or semi-annual. We created the semi-annual specifically for the IRAs, um, but you could pick an IRA or non-IRA in either one of the distribution models. Um, we pay a little bit higher on the semi-annual because we're reinvesting your money, right? It's sort of almost like a dividend reinvestment plan. We take the monthly income, we keep reinvesting it, gets you a higher return and we distribute those semi-annually. So we can, we can go back to that later if there's questions, but those are basically the... Um, so yeah, so it's uh, you know, predictable. It's designed to be uh, very much focused on uh, you know, asset preservation model. Um, if you have that strategy or you need a strategy for that certain, certain portion of your portfolio, this could be a good option for you. We've covered a lot of this. Keep moving. So um, people always come to us and they go, well, tell me what the sort of bells and whistles or what's the things that really are important to our current clientele or people that are interested in invest 
investing with us. And, and these are a lot of the answers that we get. We do a lot of current and prior and, and potential investor polls. And we ask, well, what's important to you? What do you like about it? What do you want to see more of? And these are a lot of the answers that we get. So we just put together a fun slide for that. We can keep moving. So that's, that's the last slide. We wanted to talk about returns at the end and then sort of move on to any questions that we may be able to answer. If there's any outstanding. Oh, it looks like Brendan just had to step away for just a second. Uh, he'll be right back. This is Nick. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, so I'm just going to take over for one question from Mr. Ashish. How long after the initial investment do distributions begin, Nathan? Great. That's a great question. So let's talk about that schedule. So we accept new investments and they go live on the first calendar day of every month. So if you invest with us on March 5th or March 20th, that investment goes live on April 1st and it starts earning interest on April 1st. So it earns interest immediately. You pick the monthly distribution option, your first distribution would be in May. So we would distribute May's interest, um, May's distribution would be paying you for the interest you earned uh, in April. So in, when we, in lending, you cannot charge interest until it's earned, right? So if our investors are our lenders, we are gonna pay them interest the month, uh, in what's called arrears. So it, then if, if they invested in March, start earning interest April 1st, you get paid on um, May 5th for April's interest. And then on the 5th of every month after that, for either 24 or 36 or 48 months, you would get a monthly interest distribution if you selected the monthly distribution plan. If you select the semi-annual distribution plan, those distributions come in January and July of each year. Thank you. And you could do, would you be able to do a, a reinvestment with those distributions? Yeah. So we, what, what we have is the answer is yes, but okay. it takes a pretty significant investment to get into our re, um, dividend reinvestment program. The reason is because we don't do fractional shares like a publicly traded company would. And each of our debt units is are in units of $10,000. So your investment would need to produce at least $10,000 of interest in a year so that we could issue you a new debt unit the following year. So if you, have, if you purchase 20 debt units with us and we would take $10,000 of that distribution, and instead of paying it out, we would actually issue you an additional debt unit. So the next year you would then be earning interest on 21 units instead of 20, right? Gotcha. So it, it is an option if, if um, as long as the investment size is big enough to uh, earn $10,000 in interest in a year. Great. And do you have some investors that um, they start off maybe on one model, like the semi-annual or the monthly, and maybe it's been two years and they say, hey, I'd love to switch. Is that a reasonable question that they can talk to you about? Absolutely. Um, and, and it's also important to understand that you do not have to put all of your investment into one of those categories. Mm -hmm. So you could pick both, right? So if you say, well, look, I, I you know, I, I think I'm going to invest some in my IRA and some outside of my IRA. That's fine. You can pick a semi-annual distribution in your IRA and a monthly distribution. So you have monthly cash flow in the household um, for ones outside of your um, IRA, out of your qualified accounts. But also people will take and they'll put a couple hundred thousand dollars in a two-year maturity and a couple hundred thousand dollars in a four-year maturity because it's nice to have the liquidity. You know, and then at and two years, part of it could renew and you could investigate what the rate schedule is like at that point. Yeah. And this is, uh, you brought up uh, a subject I think is a good commonly asked question because there is uh, an IRA rule. It's called uh, self-dealing. And long story short, why this comes up is if you're a passive investor, it's very easy for you to invest with personally 
and then with your IRA, because it's Nathan's team that's driving the bus and making the decisions, um, managing the fund, and so mm -hmm. on. If you are much more hands-on uh, or, or close to a project in a retirement account, you generally should avoid, um, you know, you got to read the rules or generally active avoid. Yeah. yeah, if you're an active participant, you should not mix personal money and retirement money. If you're a passive investor and very removed from management, it is much easier to look at the rules and say, okay, I can be uh, invested personally and invested as an IRA investor. That's a great point, Brennan. Um, you can bring this, uh, well, we got the contact here. We don't need to bring it down, the slides down yet, but um, yeah. So always think when you're an investor and prohibited transaction rules, am I active? Am I passive? And how much of the fund do I control? So you or myself as a random investor, we can invest in Nathan's fund and really not have to worry too much about prohibited transaction rules. If someone on Nathan's team actually decided to invest with their IRA, they would potentially have a lot more rules and, uh, you know, 10% or 50% uh, rule that you have to be aware of. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, um, I see we have a hard stop coming up. So this is the last call for questions, everyone. Seems like we're getting some coming in. Um, uh, can you share your total uh, AUM or possibly a number of investors? Yeah, so it, it does vary quite a bit, right? Um, we have investments coming in and coming out constantly. Um, at last count, we were about $20 million in AUM. And okay. we have roughly 60, low 60s in terms of open active projects. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was just a return question. We can maybe go back to that slide, Nick, but there's a higher yield on the two year compared to the three year. Uh, Mr. Gupta was just wondering why. Uh, That's a fantastic question. And, and the answer is um, short term rates. We're dealing with uh, an inverted yield curve now for any of you that are following the sort of short term versus long term interest rates. And this is actually the first time in the fund's history that this rate schedule has looked like this. Mm -hmm. And the answer to the question is the reason why it's that way for our business right now is because when rates are short term rates are high right now and prime rate is high, um, I'm able to pass on higher rates to my borrowers and collect more interest. But as rates fall down again into more of a normalized economy as inflation backs down, it's probably very likely that in the next 12 to 18 months that prime rate will come back down a bit. That's going to put downward pressure on my ability to price my product. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is that I want to create safety for every investor in our, um, in our, in our fund. And so if I start losing pricing power in the next 18 months, I want my higher term, my higher commitment and cost of funds to mature first. So I can re up new investors at rates that are more applicable to what the market's doing 18 to 24 months from now. Okay. So typically the longer the investment term, the better the yield, but for right now, probably a very, very short window, but we are offering higher rates with a less of a commitment. Got it. And Nathan, do you have a hard stop or can you go maybe another minute or two to close out? No, this I'm fine. Question? I, yeah, I got a few minutes. I know got Andrew it. had a hard stop. So yeah, we'll just making sure. Um, and, you know, I think uh, sometimes as investors, you know, they're seeing the rates change. Uh, you know, if you're not really on the ground as an investor, it can be like, well, why isn't that reflected everywhere? You know, Chase Bank and like Wells, like they haven't moved rates barely at all <laughs> to the right. annoyance of a lot of investors that just are sitting in cash accounts. But, you know, these portfolios that generate that yield those have to slowly be reallocated at the new rates. So your Nathan, your book of business is from rates maybe over the last 18 months or so, correct? Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So right. as we move into the new era, you know, there will be some lag as portfolios adjust for up or down to the new yeah. equilibrium. So we, we have several mechanisms in the portfolio to make sure like the worst business model ever is if I'm lending money at 8% and borrowing at nine. Right. So we have a lot of mechanisms within the portfolio. The, the e, e, one way we do it is we change this rate schedule 
every year. So in January, we're typically going to re release a new rate schedule. Um, it's important also to note, though, once you invest in one of these choices, that rate is fixed for the investor for the full term of that note. Okay. Right. So it doesn't going to change and go up and down. Even if we change our rate schedule next year, you're going to be tied to the investment return that you signed up for at, at the rate schedule that was active when you signed up. Got it. Um, but our, our portfolio does liquidate rather quickly. So as we have lower interest rate loans paying off, uh, we're replacing them with higher interest rate loans so that we can keep our average yield in the portfolio you know, significantly above what our cost of funds are. And that way it prevent, creates plenty of operating capital cushion. Got it. Uh, Jerry Chapman asked, does the monthly or semi-annual returns includes both interest and principal? Right. So these are interest only notes. The, the uh, annual interest rates, you're going to be paid interest only. Your principal would be paid at, at a lump sum uh, at the maturity of your term. So if you're if you're doing a two-year note, for example, you're going to get 24 incremental interest payments. And then after the 24th month, you'll get your entire investment back. So typically the way that is going to work is that about 90 days before any of our notes mature, our investors are going to get a notification. And it's going to say, hey, your note's coming up due in 90 days. Here are your options. If you'd like to get repaid all of your capital, great. We'll prepare that transaction for you. If you'd like to change the amount, raise it up or down or reinvest it, here's our new rate schedule to choose from. So you can change the amount, raise it, lower it, you can liquidate it entirely, and you're going to be given those choices about 90 days ahead of that maturity date. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Nick, if you could just go to the contact slide once again, we're going to close out here. Uh, Nathan, thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate yep. it. Uh, I thought we had a really great conversation. We got a lot, uh, talked about mm -hmm. a lot of interesting topics. This is my direct number. So happy to call, text me, shoot me an email, visit our website, the midatlanticfund.com. Um, mm -hmm. Let me know if you, anybody's got questions. I'm happy to set up appointments, take calls. Yeah, and we've been um, working on a, a discount code as well on the rocket dollar side to work with Mid-Atlantic. Um, it's been a pretty aggressive one lately. So um, if you'd love to talk to, about Nathan's team about investing with an IRA, please do. Uh, we'd love to hand you your questions. We've got tax time coming here at Rocket Dollar. Um, we've also got some pretty uh, exciting things on multi-account pricing that are now coming out um, for um, new clients. And there'll also be something I think existing clients will be really happy with. So thank you, Nathan. Appreciate it. Um, thank you thank so much you, for coming back.